and acknowledge the traditional owners, the caretakers of those lands. So thank you for joining us for this lecture today. This is our first hybrid meeting of the Catalyst program. Sounds extraordinarily important, a hybrid meeting of the Catalyst program, but indeed it is a new initiative, as you are aware, primarily headed by the Peter Wall Institute and responded to by the UBC Emeritus College. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to remind you of some housekeeping notes. The first half, half, half of the event will be a presentation by the speaker. And following this, we will have a Q&A session. People in the audience here in person can raise their hand during the Q&A and if they have a question. People on Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A box and your questions will be asked on behalf of you by a member of our team. If there are any technical issues, please write your question in the chat box. Now, to the substance of the event, Professor Catherine Harrison is the first of eight speakers and we are just delighted to have you here, uh, Kathy. Thank you for making the effort. I know you're on your way somewhere important. And we're also grateful for your willingness to, to lead off on this series. Catherine is a professor of political science at UBC. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical engineering from Western University at MIT and her PhD in political science from UBC. Before entering academia, she worked as a chemical engineer in the oil industry and as a policy analyst for the US Congress and for Environment Canada. She has been a visiting scholar at Resources for the Future, the University of Melbourne, the University of California, Berkeley, and the European University Institute. She has widely published on Canadian and US environmental and climate policy. Most recently in Nature Climate Change, Science, and Global Environmental Politics. She has advised governments from the local to international level and is currently chair of an expert advisory panel of the Canadian Climate Institute and a member of the BC Climate Solutions Council. She's a frequent media commentator on climate policy and tweets at, at Prof K Harrison. Thank you so much, uh, Kathy. You're going to talk to us about political obstacles and opportunities for Canadian climate policy. We look forward to hearing all the details. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it is a pleasure to see familiar faces and I imagine there are some others on Zoom or who may watch it um, later. This was a great opportunity for me to kind of step back and um, try to collate a lot of thoughts. So I welcome um, your your additions to that, your questions, I'll be kind of going at um, 40,000 feet, what are we, like 12,000 meters, um, with occasional dives down into more details. So um, let's get started. This figure is kind of my way of caps encapsulate, encapsulating three decades of policy failure uh, when it comes to climate change in Canada. The blue line is Canada's actual emissions, and I've, I've got the, um, the axis starting at 400 million tons going up to 800 million tons per year. Um, the x-axis is 1990 to 2030. So the blue line is reality. Um, 
climate policy really got started in 1990 in Canada with the Green Plan under Brian Mulroney. And then at this point, um, with the uh, UN Rio Conference on Environment and Development, Canada, along with many other countries, um, signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and made a non-binding commitment to get our emissions back to 1990 levels by the year 2000. So that's this orange dashed line. If we'd got started then, it would have been a whole lot easier. But instead, as you can see, our emissions kept going up. This next juncture is 1997, when Canada and many other countries negotiated the Kyoto Protocol, where um, the advanced industrialized countries committed to binding emissions reductions. And this line is um, what we would have needed to do to reach the target, um, the midpoint um, of the target period is 2010. So I've done that kind of a summary, um, steeper than uh, it would have been had we gotten started earlier, but in fact, we didn't get started. Still, emissions continued to go up until 2005, 2007. At that point, we see a pretty steep drop, but it wasn't actually because of anything governments did. It's because of the global financial crisis. The economy contracted and emissions went down. Um, there was a bunch of different targets in there, but the next big event is this one, the Kyoto, I'm uh, not Kyoto, um, Copenhagen agreement where Canada committed non-binding again to match the U.S., reduce our emissions 17% by 2020. That's the yellow dash line. Well, we didn't do it again. And the next two moments are negotiating the um, Paris Agreement in 2015, where Canada committed to reduce our emissions 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. And then COP, um, what are we at, uh, 25 or 26, when we um, increased our ambitions. So we have had no shortage of ambitious targets, but virtually um, no success in actually reducing our emissions consistent with any of those targets. So how come, why are we so bad at this? The first obstacle, political obstacle, is that Canada has a very greenhouse gas intensive economy. This graph from our world and data is per capita greenhouse gas emissions. We're also in the top 10 of absolute greenhouse gas emitting countries, despite our very small population. But just going with the colors, you can see that Canada, along with um, Australia, Saudi Arabia, are very emissions intensive economies. So high per capita greenhouse gas emissions. On one hand, that suggests that we should be one of the, we should be the countries that are leading because we have the farthest to go. Um, but politically, it means that the industries that are producing a lot of those emissions are very politically powerful. The incumbent, the existing industries know who they are, the investors know who they are, and the workers in those industries know who they are, whereas the new low carbon industries that will need to replace them um, are still often hypothetical and nobody knows that that's their job on the line. This next figure shows the sources of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions as of 2020. The, the biggest share is from production of oil and gas. That's 27% now, the largest. The second largest share is transportation at 24%. Um, so those two alone are more than half of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. The other way to think about it is that there are small sources and big sources. The big sources, including oil and gas, electricity generation, heavy industry account for just under half of Canada's emissions. And the other half is the small sources like buildings and farms and moving around in individual vehicles. So it's not just big industry, but big industry is an important challenge. This figure is showing what's been happening in individual sectors over this period. Um, Hopefully it's big enough to see, but the two ones I want to draw your attention to are these two lines up here. Two of them don't look like the other ones. 
The orange one is the oil and gas industry, and the gray one is transportation emissions. That includes both individual motor vehicles, medium and heavy trucks, and things like um, airplanes and rail. The two of those are going up for different reasons. Um, the, the gray line, the transportation, a lot of what's going on there is that um, Canadians shifted to less fuel efficient vehicles, even as we've been talking about climate change. So they went from smaller vehicles to um, SUVs, minivans en masse over the 1990s. The orange line, which is oil and gas production, again, this isn't, doesn't include actually burning the oil and gas. This is just getting it out of the ground. Um, it may include refining emissions. I can't remember. Um, what's going on there are two things. One of them is simply an increase in the scale of production. So Canada has been producing more oil and more gas for export almost entirely to the U.S., during this period. And the other thing is that our emissions per unit per barrel of oil or per ton of gas have been going up as we've shifted from conventional oil and gas, you know, a pump jack, um, moving the stuff up to the surface to unconventional. Um, production has shifted over this period to the tar sands for oil and to fracking. Uh, for gas. And that is more, those are more emissions intensive sources. And in fact, in the case of oil, we disproportionately, we all, you know, almost all of our emissions these days are the heavy, unconventional and more carbon intensive oil. We hear a lot about the oil industry's aspirations to reduce their emissions. They're a very politically powerful industry still in Canada. And, um, we hear things like the industry is committed, at least some of them, to getting to net zero in 2050. Um, two, three years ago, the mantra was that Canada would match the cleanest oil in the world, the lowest carbon emissions per barrel. This is a figure from a 2018 publication that compared different sources of crude globally. Um, the print's very small, but the blue lines are the emissions per barrel of oil. And this is Canada up here. I think I've cut off. Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing it here. So we're fourth, fourth highest. So we may have aspirations to be the cleanest oil, pr produce the cleanest oil in the world, but we are so far from that where we are right now. And we should not assume that all these other folks don't also have aspirations to reduce their emissions per barrel in order to beat us and they've got a big head start. So Canada's oil is more emissions intensive and is vulnerable for that reason. Um, and that's been a big part. The resistance from carbon intensive industries, including oil and gas has blocked um, Canadian clim climate policies time and again since 1990. The other aspect of Canada's economy is that it's tightly integrated with the US. Most of our exports go to the US, most of our imports come from the US. Um, and that means that how Canada's climate policies compare with those of our major trading partner and much larger um, trading partner ha has big implications. And those have gone in different directions. In the case of the negotiation of the Kyoto Protocol, in 1997, the U.S. gave Canada a nudge and increased the ambition of Canada's target because they expected us to stay in lockstep with them. So the U.S. committed to a 7% reduction um, by uh, roughly 2010. The Canada was close behind at 6%. The difference was allowing for the fact, the expectation that Canada would produce more gas to um, facilitate the US uh, moving from oil to gas. Um, so that was pressure, but it's also easier for Canada to increase its ambition if it's in lockstep with the US because major industries aren't complaining that they will be disadvantaged competitively with their trading partners. Soon thereafter, um, 
uh, President Bush announced that the U.S. would not, in fact, ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And there wasn't yet a plan on the table. The federal government, the provinces, various industrial sectors had been talking for four years at that point. And that's when all hell broke loose and they sort of went public with their opposition. Um, uh, major industrial sectors opposed Canada's ratification of the Kyoto Protocol if the U.S. wasn't going to be in, various provincial governments did. So it made it harder for Canada to move forward. Canada did ratify, but then didn't do anything um, and basically didn't undertake any of the significant actions in the plan. The Obama administration coming into office in the U.S. created another moment of opportunity for Canada. It was an interesting time because um, we had a conservative government under Stephen Harper that wasn't particularly known as a, a climate champion. But again, there's this expectation for Canada to march in lockstep with the U.S. The Harper government committed to joining in a North America-wide emissions trading scheme, um, matching the sectoral standards approach of the U.S., um, honestly, when it comes to motor vehicles, it's hard for Canada not to match the U.S. because we're producing vehicles for sale in the U.S. So we're making vehicles to U.S. standards anyway, and it's more difficult to have separate standards um, for those manufacturers. Um, then we've got this period in the other direction, the Trump administration withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, Canada stayed in. And this is actually a critical moment where unlike the first round, Canada continued to move forward, um, if not at a pace many would like to see. And now we've got the Biden administration, the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a big deal for U.S. emissions, but actually pretty complicated from a Canada-U.S. perspective, because to a large degree, the U.S. is shifting to um, reliance on the spending instrument. So we can't compare the effect of carbon prices either through regulation or pricing. What it does do is it threatens Canada's oil and gas exports to the extent the US moves away from gasoline powered vehicles, um, moves towards electric heat pumps. One aspect of the industry side um, in Canada, which we, tend not to talk about that much is the, the distinction between the oil and gas industry's emissions to extract those products and the downstream combustion emissions from those exports, which are much larger. Um, most of the carbon footprint of a barrel of oil takes place at the point where we actually burn the oil. And that's in another country and it's not our responsibility under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This figure is from a new resource called the Fossil Fuel Re Registry, which was just released this week. It's super fun to play with. Um, you'll see the top ones, those are extraction emissions. I think also refining within the country. Um, and Canada is you know, rel relatively modest compared to the US, which is the largest oil producer in the world. But look at the difference between our top bubble and the bottom one. That bottom one is the combustion emissions from the oil and gas and coal that we produce within Canada. So Canada's carbon footprint, if you take into account the profits that we're making from sending fossil fuels elsewhere is much bigger, but we tend not to talk about it. it's not our responsibility. And oddly, um, in some ways we have had, um, it's made it easier to pass policies to reduce our own domestic emissions because there have been political deals for that in exchange for facilitating more production and export of fossil fuels. So that's the oil and gas industry and other carbon intensive industries, a huge political obstacle. Second obstacle is a political institution of federalism. Um, federalism is different in different countries. Canada has a particularly decentralized federal system and one that is especially challenging when it comes to climate change because provincial governments control most of the land in the country. About 90% of Canada is still crown lands. Now the ownership of that is obviously contested in many cases by First Nations that never sign treaties or have signed treaties where the um, interpretation is strongly disputed, but 
under Canadian, um, the Canadian constitution and Canadian jurisprudence, the provincial governments control the resources on and underneath that land, which means they own the oil and gas and the coal. And provincial governments have relied heavily on exploiting those, um, those fossil fuels and other natural resources as a source of provincial government revenues, royalties, um, as a source of economic development, the, sh the most important way to win votes in your province is to create jobs. And this has been a critical um, tool for provincial governments to drive their economies through development of provincial resources. And in certain provinces, especially just um, integral to the political culture of that place. So in Alberta, that the idea that Alberta has to control its own resources is kind of the definition of being, part of the definition of being a, a, an Albertan, but not just Alberta, also Quebec, which um, tends to argue about political in, uh, federal intrusion with respect to provincial resources. So that's enough of a challenge. And on top of it, we have layered since the 1960s, a norm of expecting federal provincial consensus on matters of environmental policy. Now, this isn't a constitutional requirement, although oftentimes provincial governments talk about it as if it is, it is simply a norm. And it's one I think that's been reinforced by Canadian, the Canadian public's love of our politicians getting along. We just love the idea of federal and provincial governments getting along and we hate it when they fight. The problem is we need them to fight a whole lot more in Canadian climate policy. What's happened is when that basically has given a veto to different provinces at different times. And that veto has been very valuable if you consider the difference in per capita emissions of different provinces. So this is a snapshot from 2018. Um, on the far left, we've got the Canadian average um, up just under 20 tons per person per, per year, Alberta and Saskatchewan are over three times that in terms of their emissions, um, variation among the other provinces as well. The Alberta and Saskatchewan numbers are a combination of relatively low population, very high um, production of emissions intensive fossil fuels, and it's flat. So they don't have hydropower like um, British Columbia. They burn, have historically burned coal as a source of electricity. The difference between, say, Quebec, which is the least emissions intensive province, and um, Saskatchewan, which is the most, is much greater than the difference between any two countries in the world. What this has meant is that in those federal provincial consensual decisions, Alberta and Saskatchewan have had a very different interest and have often vetoed action um, to develop national climate policies, but not only them, Quebec has also often resisted Ontario, which is the home of the um, automobile manufacturing sector in Canada for many years, also resisted national regulation of motor vehicle emissions. This is the absolute rather than per capita emissions. And what I wanna draw your attention to is the trend from blue to orange to gray. And what you see is that in Alberta and Saskatchewan, emissions have continued to go up from 1990 to 2018. In a province like Ontario, they went up and then they went down again. VCs also had some growth during that period, but it means that actions by the less carbon intensive provinces have been outweighed by emissions growth in the, um, the two provinces that have contributed most of Canada's oil production. Obstacle three, voters. Um, the Canadians for the most part believe that climate change is happening and it's caused by human activity. And if you ask them, should governments do something about climate change, they say yes, for the most part. Um, but they're not always paying attention. It's not necessarily the top of mind issue. Now, this is a very tough test. It's asking um, survey respondents, what is the single most important problem facing Canada today? Um, this is data from Environics. I've only, they ask all kinds of things. I've only got three lines in here. 
The blue one is the economy. The green one is anything related to environment or climate change. On the far right, we've got a kind of gray one for the cost of living. And there's actually one dot on the very far right, around 40%, that's COVID, um, when it suddenly appeared on the agenda. Most of the time, the environment and climate change are fairly low on the list of the public's priorities. There have been two periods, those two green spikes where it was the top issue, and governments started promising lots of things. That first one is um, the, uh, the, 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 where are we at there? 2006 to 2008, that's when even the Harper government started completely changing its positions on climate policy. We had a brief period um, around the time of the, was that 2019 election, 27, yeah, 2019 election where the climate was a hot issue. Um, so is it a priority for voters? This is a graph, um, this is work by, um, Eric LaChapelle at U2M and um, Matt O'Mildenberger, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, you can play with these maps, it's pretty cool. This one is the percent of respondents who indicate that the earth is getting warmer. Looks pretty good, even in Alberta and Saskatchewan, it's over 50% uh, and much higher in other provinces. This next one is the percent of respondents who say that the earth is getting wa warmer partly or mostly as a result of human activity. And it's a whole lot less red. So their scientists are at 100% on that question or very, very close to it, but there is still a large fraction of Canadian voters who are unsure and it is the majority in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So there's still strong resistance to um, human, human activity causing climate change in the Canadian Federation. So not paying attention, not necessarily sure that um, humans are causing it. And then even those who do think climate change is caused by human activity, and they do think it's urgent, aren't necessarily keen to pay costs themselves. So climate change is quite distinct from historical environmental problems where the issue was a factory polluting a river or polluting the air. And so it's someone else, that factory has to clean up its act. If you recall that um, pie chart, exploded pie chart, where half of the emissions in Canada are small sources, we are half the problem, but we tend to deny that. Um, this figure on the left comes from a, um, an op-ed that Blake Schaffer did, uh, I think drawing on IEA data, comparing the um, fuel economy of um, vehicles, passenger vehicles in different countries, we're number one in a bad way. We drive the least fuel efficient vehicles in the world. And it's no accident that Jason Kenney, when he is trying to rouse opposition to a carbon tax that had a quite modest impact on the price of gasoline, does so driving a big old pickup truck and talking about how the federal government wants to take away your truck. So we've got um, the Premier of Alberta in his big pickup truck and uh, um, ax the carbon tax sign on the side of that truck. That regionalism, public opinion and is overlaps with a deepening partisan divide in Canada. And that partisan divide is particularly great when it comes to climate change. This is um, a figure from a paper that Chris Borick and Eric LaChapelle presented at the American Political Science Association meeting last week. Um, and there's a, a lot going on here. I just wanna draw your attention to this line right here. It is the fraction of respondents who are sure that climate change is caused by human activity, 71, 72% for the New Democrats and liberals and 29% for conservatives. So the climate change deniers have migrated to the conservative party. And 20 at the bottom here, 
28% of those conservative respondents, and that's a national um, representative national sample, 28% think there is no solid evidence of global warming. Um, this one is from, um, actually that's, this is, that belongs with the previous slide. This is um, Alice Lay PCA and a group of colleagues, including me, that were looking at determinants of public opposition to um, carbon taxes. Um, the left column is opposed, the right column is those who support. Um, a few things are noteworthy. Education has a big impact. Those with only a high school education are more likely to oppose. Those with university or graduate are more likely to support. Um, but the biggest effects are down here. Conservatives oppose, liberals support. Um, strong, uh, substantively important coefficient and statistically significant. And to a large degree, Canadians are getting their signals on climate policy from the partisans that they trust. Part Politics is a team sport and people have picked their team and they are concluding very different things because they're hearing very different messages. So this is some work on um, perceptions of carbon tax rebates um, that I did along with Madel Mildenberger, Eric LaChapelle, and um, Isabel Stottelman Stefan in Canada and Switzerland. And in this case, we took our respondent group in Ontario and Saskatchewan. In both of those provinces, there is a federal carbon tax on households and households get um, all the money is returned to households, give or take a few percent, at the same amount. So we were able, because we know based on how many adults live in the household, how many children there are, what province they're in and whether they're in a rural or urban area. We were able to create a mock, a mock up of the, um, the, uh, one of the, the income tax schedules where in 2019, they were um, applying for their tax rebates. And we showed half of the people exactly how much money they were getting back with a big red circle around it. And the other half, we didn't show them that and we just asked them. So the control group didn't get the, the mock-up tax response, the treatment group did. The black is adding up all of the respondents, showing them what we knew from previous surveys was that almost everyone was underestimating how much money they were getting back in their family. When we showed them how much money they were getting back, they adjusted their estimates of how much they were getting back, but it had no impact on the fraction of people who supported carbon pricing. Some positive impact on the liberals, um, some negative impact or no impact on the conservatives. The figure on the right is when we ask them a different question, because we were stunned by this. Um, we asked them a different question, which was, do you think you are um, on balance paying more or getting more back? And what we found, have a look at the blue dots in the figure on the right, this bar and this bar. After we showed people how much money they were getting back and they realized they were getting more back, they rationalized their opposition to the carbon tax by assuming that they must be paying even more if they're getting that much back. So the, the partisan team was stronger than their own economic self-interest given information. Uh, so Canadian climate politics, a combination of belief in the science, regionalism, and longstanding uh, partisan affiliations has resulted in a very deep um, partisan cleavages. It's not just a natural thing. This is being created and reinforced by partisan messaging. Um, not just on the carbon tax, but it's sort of easiest to point to that on the carbon tax. It, it started with the NDP in British Columbia, but has in, um, in 2008, 2009, 
but for the most part is confined now to the Conservative Party of Canada and their provincial counterparts who argue that these policies are costly. They tend to emphasize the price at the pump, which is especially salient for Canadians, bearing in mind that we're driving those great big gas guzzling vehicles, that carbon pricing doesn't work. This is not true based on academic studies, that it is unfair to you. And a lot of those messages have been about somebody else must be to blame for this problem. Um, and then often reinforced, and this has been in many countries, Australia, uh, you know, we've seen it in Alberta, we've seen it Canada wide. Um, they're coming for your truck, your barbecue, your church, or your, you know, your Sunday roast was a big thing in Australia, your hamburgers. Um, meat is a big issue right now in, in uh, French climate politics. So these are signals that people are getting from the party leaders that they trust and they have had a big impact. So comparing conservative voters to liberals, they're much more likely to reject climate science. They overestimate how much carbon pricing is costing them. They underestimate how much money they're getting back and they are resistant to new information, even if it's in their financial interest. Okay, so those are the obstacles. What have we had as a result? Well, we've had as a result, a lot of really ineffective climate policy in Canada for a very long time. Splitting it into sort of the first period and the three big uh, periods, the first mostly under Jean Chrétien and the Liberals, um, 19, 90, I've started, but 93 to 2006, ambitious targets, but, and then plans, but they didn't actually do the things that were in their own plans. Instead, what they did is the kind of easy, reasonably popular things that don't make anyone mad. Voluntary programs for industry and for households. Some of us will remember the one ton challenge. It didn't work. Um, Modest subsidies, voters like to be given money, um, but the amount of money on the table was not enough to actually drive down Canada's emission. And none of the things, none of the binding and politically challenging policies like regulation and carbon pricing. This middle period corresponds to that blip in voters' attention to the environment and climate. And even under Stephen Harper, we saw some shifts at the federal level um, committing to a cap and trade program in lockstep with the US, more meaningful action that was abandoned before it actually happened, um, more meaningful action in some of the provinces, including British Columbia, which adopted a carbon tax, Quebec joined the Western Climate Initiative, and Ontario had the biggest impact in phasing out coal fired electricity generation. Then a period, a third period from 2009 to 2015, where um, the Obama administration's legislation had failed in Congress and they were going the sector by sector route. The Harper government committed that Canada would match that approach, but they only matched the easy targets. They matched the US's tailpipe standards for motor vehicles, again, hard not to. Um, and they kind of regulate, I mean, they officially regulated emissions from electricity generation, but they gave coal fired power plants um, 20 years more before they had to shut down. So the impact was very modest. Lots changed though in 2015, um, two key elections. The first was the election of an NDP government in Alberta, which although short lived had a big impact on the national policy landscape. The, the figure in the top right is Rachel Notley with her, um, Environment Minister Shannon Phillips at her left announcing Alberta's climate leadership plan. And on the stage were um, uh, First Nations, oil industry, union, and environmental leaders. And when I did interviews in Alberta, I was surprised how many people had a version of this picture on their wall in their office at least three years ago. Um, the key moment there was that Alberta wanted to establish price um, policy competitiveness in order to improve the reputation of Alberta's oil industry. And the policy that the 
jurisdiction that had the highest extant carbon price at the time was British Columbia next door at $30 per ton. So they committed to extend carbon pricing, which at that point only applied to very large oil sands producers across the provincial economy and to raise the price to $30 per ton. That was not going to reduce emissions from the oil and gas industry. In fact, there was an expectation of continued emissions growth because the marginal cost at that point was about $70 per ton, but it established Alberta's cred in a national conversation that they were willing to impose some costs on their own voters um, and kind of brought them, bought them a place at the table federally. The federal government's um, position in negotiating the pan-Canadian framework with provincial governments largely took Alberta's climate plan as a template and took it national. Um, and so since 2015, under the Liberals, we have seen a shift from those modest spending and voluntary programs to actual um, regulations of methane, um, eventually a clean fuel standard, um, Carbon pricing was the centerpiece of the federal policy, uh, and that was a critical moment where in 2017, all 2017, 2018, all provinces except Saskatchewan were on board with the federal carbon pricing strategy, and then it all fell apart um, in 2018. There were changes in government um, through elections, um, in Ontario, in Manitoba, eventually in Alberta. And so the support, provincial support and provincial near consensus had unraveled and a critical moment is the feds forged ahead anyway and imposed the federal backstop in provinces that were willing to match the federal carbon price and scope through a provincial policy. Um, okay. So that's the, that's the obstacles, why we failed to date, where are the opportunities? And I will start by saying that as a political scientist who does empirical work, it is actually much easier for me to explain failure because we've had a lot of it. To the extent I'm trying to say, how do we understand what's happened? Well, what's happened is bad, um, but as a human being, I remain a stubborn optimist. And the reason I do this work is because I try to find where are the points of leverage? How could we create more effective politics? Because as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, it's gonna keep getting worse until we get to net zero. The faster we get to net zero, the less the, um, the amount of warming that the world, and in most of our cases, our children and grandchildren, will experience. So where are the, the points of promise in this system? And actually, you know, I'm feeling better than I have in a while. Um, federalism, the federal provincial landscape has shifted. It was like an earthquake that the Trudeau government imposed carbon pricing on unwilling provinces in 2019. And whatever you think about carbon pricing as a policy tool, it was a huge deal because for decades, federal governments in Canada have not been willing to undertake environmental policies of almost any kind if the provinces said no, or even if any province said no. So that was a huge moment in the fall of 2016, when the prime minister stood up in the House of Commons and said, we're going to do this unless they you know, meet our standards. And all hell broke loose at a provincial, federal provincial environment minister's meeting that was taking place at the same time. Some provinces went home, I'm told, but they did it anyway. And they imposed a very politically challenging policy in the months leading up to a federal election. Um, it led to a pretty epic battle with um, the provinces that opposed that policy and they lost in the Supreme Court. So the federal government has rejected this norm. It was never a constitutional requirement and they've had support from the Supreme Court, very strong support 
in doing so. Now, the way we've gone about it with this, you know, the feds let the provinces have a shot first and have given them some flexibility and only step in if they don't do it. Um, has resulted in a pretty ugly patchwork of policies. This is a figure from a, um, a report by uh, the Canadian Climate Institute, Dave Sawyer and um, Dale Bougin, and possibly some other co-authors. I actually kind of like that the colors look so bad because it is a pretty ugly patchwork. The encouraging thing is that with the new, the updated federal um, benchmark, they are closing loopholes rather than extending them to other provinces. So we aren't at consistency by any means, but some of the most offending um, loopholes that provinces were able to take advantage of are being um, restricted going forward from 2022 to 2030. In the case of business opposition, um, a, I think a, a very important thing is the decline in the US, a huge thing is the decline in the price of solar and wind. I think in Canadian politics, a bigger issue is the de um, decline or the increase in the affordability of electric vehicles. And the auto industry has historically been kind of the Eastern counterpart to the oil and gas industry in the West. But when it comes to climate change, historically they were kind of on the same page, leave us alone. Um, but it is potential, it is a lot easier to reconcile the auto industry's interests with climate action than the oil industry. The oil industry's products used as intended cause climate change. They create energy by producing a CO2 molecule. The auto industry's products can still get people around with a different fuel, electricity rather than oil. So the greater affordability has made a big difference in shifting that conversation. Um, Canadian governments during COVID spent a lot of money. For the most part, the federal government, I mean, they did give money to the oil and gas industry and they gave them another big chunk in the 2022 budget. They gave more money to um, low carbon industries. Um, certainly billions for electric vehicle and battery manufacturer, especially in Quebec and Ontario, um, but also um, funding new sectors because we tend to talk about the need to shift from fossil energy to clean energy. That's not enough for the Canadian economy where we produce a huge amount of oil and gas for export. So if we shift Canadians consumption from dirty energy to clean energy, that's not going to deal with this big problem of all the oil and gas we're still producing. So um, they are in sort of seeding other low carbon industries. And critically, it wasn't just about spending because industries that hurt were hurting were also asking for regulatory relief, delay development of policies, um, weaken uh, enforcement monitoring. And for the most part, the federal government and British Columbia did not back off there. The US, um, the COVID moment, I think, was a big part of the US Inflation Reduction Act. And that now, through spending on um, transition from gas for space heating and um, from fossil powered to um, electric vehicles, sends a very strong message to the Canadian oil and gas industry, almost all of its exports of which go to, um, go to the US. The big one to watch for is the proposal for an oil and gas cap. That is a cap on that 27% of emissions and driving it down steeply by 2030 and to net zero in 2050. And that is going to be um, possibly the hottest thing in Canadian politics, certainly in Canadian climate politics for the next year or two. Opportunities from a shift in strategy from um, environmental NGOs and indigenous nations. Uh, two things have happened in the last 10, 12 years. One of them has been the emergence of a keep it in the ground movement. Historically, environmental groups engaging on climate change were focused on the point of combustion things like um, power plants producing electricity by burning fossil fuels. And we have seen a shift to opposition to extraction and transport of raw materials through pipelines. Um, 
Most of that has been organized in the provinces that don't produce the fossil fuels and are thus less dependent economically on that industry. Um, opponents have also relied on litigation. Indigenous communities have employed both litigation and blockades. The results are pretty mixed. Um, contributed to some victories in um, blocking or abandonment of the Northern Gateway Pipeline Energy East. In the US, um, I think bigger gains in blocking Keystone XL and Joe Manchin's willingness to sign on to the IRA had a lot to do with the fact that he wanted to get a pipeline built through his state. So contributed to the conditions for passage of that legislation. But on the other hand, some really big defeats. It hasn't been possible um, to stop the LNG train in British Columbia because the economic benefits um, are contained within British Columbia along with the transit um, infrastructure. Um, Trans Mountain, uh, at the end of the day, the federal government just stepped in and bought and is now building the pipeline. We saw a huge build of um, youth opposition or calls for action through climate strike culminating in uh, the fall of 2019. That's really been, um, you know, taking a kick in the teeth from COVID. Um, you know, I think young people have been hit hard in so many ways. Certainly, there's still high levels of concern, but the numbers are not the same. And um, tomorrow, there is a youth climate event on the anniversary of that huge um, uh, event. There was, I think they estimate 500,000 people in the streets in Montreal, over 100,000 in Vancouver, and there's almost no attention to the event downtown on Friday afternoon. So whether that will um, come back, I'm not sure. This one, at what point will voters recognize that humankind is facing a threat to our existence? And, um, you know, in British Columbia, we should know better than anyone we have seen a heat dome that killed over 600 British Columbians alone. They baked alone in their beds, waiting for um, ambulances in many cases, massive flooding a few months later um, in the, the Fraser Valley. Um, and part, you know, part of me just really wants to believe that you see enough of these things and people will get it but I'm also struck by how short our memories are. The one at the bottom is not actually Vancouver, although it looks a lot like Vancouver in one of our poor air quality events. It's Edmonton on the day the Alberta government repealed that province's carbon tax. They had actually canceled the uh, public event because it was unsafe to be outside um, and moved it inside. So um, maybe, maybe um, I'm, I'm, at what point do, we, we hear the phrase wake up call so much. And um, one of the things that's had a big impact on me that uh, someone said to me is that um, it's a proverb, I can't remember from what country that it, if you keep giving someone wake up call after wake up call, maybe you have to accept that they're just pretending to be asleep. And I wonder whether what we're really seeing is the resistance of those folks who just don't believe this is caused by human activity or are not willing to pay a price. Um, some more optimistic things, some work that I've done with colleagues um, found that uh, support for climate policy did not decline during in Canada during COVID. There's a theory called the, you know, a finite pool of worry, the idea that voters only have so much attention and that they will shift at least for um, a period of a couple of years, they remain concerned about climate change, supportive of climate, um, of carbon pricing. And the thing that built the greatest support for COVID spending was if there was a climate element to it. Um, there seems to be something going on in public opinion where there is a high, there are high levels of concern for the economy and concern for climate are coinciding in a way they never have before. They've always been substitutes for each other. Um, that one I'm less sure about, but I'm struck whenever I look at polls at election time. This next one I think is potentially really important because 
that that first slide where I showed failure after failure, here's a commitment, we didn't do it. Here's another commitment, we didn't do it, is to a large degree about lack of accountability. Voters here at government say, we're gonna do all this great stuff and we're gonna reduce emissions. And I think for most of the time they thought they were actually doing something. Um, the federal government and some provinces have passed climate accountability legislation. Um, in Canada, it's the Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act. It establishes independent bodies that have a statutory duty to report on whether the plan is credible, whether the government is on track to meeting its targets. And we will start seeing those reports regularly. Um, that BC has a, a similar panel that I'm part of. Um, the other thing that we've seen is most of those previous plans were not credible. Like any sort of you know, serious academics looking at them wouldn't believe it was ever going to meet the target. The first time we had a plan that could credibly meet a target was the um, federal 2020 Healthy Environment, Healthy Economy Plan. And then again, in the 2022 Emissions Reduction Plan. Now you may disagree with whether those targets are enough, but it was a huge step forward to actually have a plan that might credibly meet that target. And that had an impact I've argued on the 2021 federal election because it was no longer possible for other parties to just put forward total bullshit platforms on climate because they could be called out on it. And there's some, I've had some liberals talk about the Jackard effect that Mark Jackard models these, these plans and has a huge audience. Um, I think Mark is part of it, but I think it has empowered other parties and also academics to speak out and say, where's, you know, show us why we should believe you. Um, next federal election, one interesting thing, Pierre Poilievre said, you know, the first thing you'll do is get rid of the carbon tax. If he does that, he's going to have to get rid of quarterly checks that in Alberta and Saskatchewan will probably be delivering over $2,000 a year to many households. Um, they may say they hate the carbon tax now, but if you actually propose to take $2,000 away from them, that's going to be salient. So we'll see what that does to the politics. But I think the big issue to watch for with the next federal election is um, what issues are on top, are top of mind for voters. It seems pretty clear at this point that the Conservatives are counting on enough voters that they want to take from the Liberals not caring very much about climate change. And my last opportunity, and I've got it in quotations because it's a really ugly one, is that the opportunity for Canada, or at least the world, is for the rest of the world to put our fossil fuel industry out of business. Because again, most of the emissions from Canadian fossil fuel exports are happening in those other countries to the extent the other countries get serious about reducing their emissions, it poses a very large economic threat to Canada. Now, this figure comes from the International Energy Agency's World Energy Outlook 2021 report. They put these reports out every year. Um, and the, they have different scenarios. They're not predictions, but they're scenarios of what would happen under a certain set of expectations. The blue line is what would we expect under existing policies, the stated policies and programs in different countries. The yellow line is the pledges under the Paris Agreement that, that countries had made going into um, the international negotiations in Glasgow last fall. And you can see, because those announced pledges are more ambitious, the most countries' expectations of millions of barrels per day of production go down from the blue line to the yellow line. They are producing less under the yellow scenario than the blue scenario. That's also true of Canada, but Canada is the only country that under the announced pledges scenario, so well short of 1.5 or 2C of ambition, we see an actual contraction in our oil and gas industry. And that's because of the emissions intensity of production and the cost of production. So when um, global demand declines, there's every reason to expect that Canada's oil will be one of the first ones hit. And if we wait 
for this approach, it's going to be much more painful because we will not be prepared. Um, communities will be um, hit much harder and um, workers will not be protected in the same way that we um, might be able to do. And that's it. I'm happy to talk about any of it.